pressing on in the Westminster Larger Catechism with no bumper music so that we maximize the time because I got a lot to do today. <clears throat> okay, question number 10. What are the personal properties of the three persons in the Godhead? Answer. It is proper to the Father to beget the Son, and to the Son to be begotten of the Father, and to the Holy Ghost to proceed from the Father and the Son from all eternity. And so this is a, uh, uh, an important uh, point here. The persons of the Godhead um, are distinguished um, from one another, not in their essence or in their glory or their being, um, but they are distinguished from one another <clears throat> in their properties, the personal properties, and also in the economy of salvation, uh, and the economy of what they do in salvation and the salvation of mankind. Um, failure to understand the difference between what theologians you know, very helpfully refer to as the ontological trinity, God as he is in himself, versus the economic trinity, uh, God as he acts in redemption. Um, a failure to understand that resulted in, you know, all kinds of subtle forms of what you would call subordinationism, uh, especially during the patristic period. Um, you have people calling Jesus God. You know, Ignatius refers to Jesus as our God 14 times in his um, genuine epistles. Um, so you, you definitely have clear teaching on the deity of Christ. But as, you, as it develops in those early centuries, you have little hints of subordinationism, like the son is, is lesser than the father. And that, that was because, you know, the son clearly, and especially in John's gospel, is does nothing of himself, but only what I hear and learn from the Father. It's a voluntary submission, though, within the Trinity uh, with, for the purpose of man's salvation. It has nothing to do with their essence. It has nothing to do with um, Jesus being ontologically in his being less than um, God the Father. But it's, it's important to distinguish what the persons of the Godhead do. One of the ways I've taught this to my children is that I've asked them the question, did God the Father become incarnate? And they know that the answer is no. Did God the Holy Spirit become incarnate? No. Did God the Son become incarnate? Yes. Okay, so it's not, um, you know, all three persons becoming incarnate in Jesus Christ. When we say that Jesus is God, we're not saying he's all three persons, but the second person, God the Son, becomes incarnate. One of the things that we do at the church here is we, um, uh, this past summer, we started a thing where we would get together and we, the session, the elders of the church got together and kind of put together a list with some other members of the congregation of movies. And we wanted to watch movies that were, you know, watchable as a congregation um, and also have discussions about them and to, to look at them from the perspective of a Christian worldview. And one of the movies that we made the decision to watch was The Shack. Now, The Shack has got just horrendous stuff in it there were there were a number of, of things that were positive talking points in it but one of the issues that comes up in the in the film is the the black woman that plays god the father shows scars in her wrists to this guy in the movie and you get this that, that's actually an ancient heresy patropassianism that the father was the one who suffered on the cross and i immediately was thinking you know there there it is you see these ancient um Trinitarian heresies, ancient Christological heresies that come up um, over and over again in modern days. They, they just have different names and, and different ways of, of putting them forward. But it's important to recognize that the persons of the Godhead, the God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, are equal in power and glory. They are of the same substance. That word substance is, is a helpful term. Um, that Greek word, usia, uh, the way it was used by the Council of Nicaea, homo. Usia, he is the, the son, is the same substance as the father. Now, even though that's not a biblical way of saying that, that was a useful way of saying it because it forced the deniers of the full deity of Christ out into the open because they were willing to use the biblical terminology, but they were redefining it and so on and so forth. So when the terminology, okay, how about, do you believe that God, that, that God the Father and God the Son are the same substance? substance, that's when it was, no, 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 we don't believe that. And that's what forced them out into the open. So anyway, so it's proper for the father to beget uh, the son, Hebrews 1, 5, for to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son, and so forth. And also, um, and to the Holy Ghost to proceed from the father and the son from all eternity. John 15, 26, but when the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the father, so Jesus is the one who sends the helper from the Father, 
the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. And Galatians 4, 6. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. So the spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Because it says there, John, Jesus said, I shall send. The parakletos, I will send him. And so that's why the, the whole filioque thing, it's right there in scripture. It's taught in scripture. Um, and that's why we say he proceeds from the Father and the Son from all eternity. Question 11. How doth it appear that the Son and the Holy Ghost are God equal to the Father? Answer. The scriptures manifest that the Son and the Holy Ghost are equal, are God equal with the Father, ascribing unto them such names, attributes, works, and worship as are proper only to God. And numerous passages cited. We went over those um, a lot of these in the, the previous um, uh, installment of this series on the larger catechism. Um, one of the clearest, I think, is Colossians 1.16, that the Son is said to have created all things. By him all things were created. And there's many, many, many other testimonies to the deity of, the Christ, uh, deity of Christ and, and the deity of the Holy Spirit. Um, but you see the, the triune formula in, throughout Scripture in reference to God. You see God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. If you're looking for it, you'll see it all over the place uh, in, in Scripture. Okay, question 12. What are the decrees... Of God, very important question. A very important question here. I think a lot of um, Christian people, a lot of people who who are professing Christians, would really be helped if they understood what Scripture teaches about God's decrees. Now, what what, what do we mean by decrees? Here's the answer: God's decrees are the wise, free, and holy acts of the counsel of His will, whereby from all eternity He hath, for His own glory, unchangeably foreordained whatsoever comes to pass in time, especially concerning angels. And men. Ephesians 1.11. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So that the term counsel there, that Greek term boule, is really where we get the, the English word decree. God has a will. He has a, a secret decreed providence, a, a secret decree that he is executing in the works of creation and providence. Okay. Um, Another passage uh, is uh, Psalm 33, 11. The counsel of the Lord, the decrees of the Lord, uh, stand forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Um, now, I've preached a number of sermons on God's uh, absolute meticulous sovereignty. One of the things that's always amazed me uh, about when you look at what Scripture teaches about this is God claims sovereignty over so many different spheres, uh, over so many different kinds of things. Arthur W. Pink's book, The Sovereignty of God, really brings a lot of that out. But one of the, the passages of scripture that always struck me um, is, is Jesus' words in Matthew 10, 29. He says, Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin, and not one of them falls apart from your father's will? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. And you think God's will, his plan, his decree, extends even to the deaths of sparrows? And what, what is he, Jesus doing in saying that? It's an argument from the lesser to the greater. If he is sovereign over such mundane things as that, um, then he's obviously sovereign over everything. We wouldn't say, well, he's sovereign over the deaths of sparrows, but not eagles or, or not blue jays or, or robins or something like that. Um, Proverbs 16, 30, or 33, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. So there really is nothing, ultimately, that is left to chance. If chance really were a force in the universe, then God is not God. Uh, ultimately, chance would be ultimate, um, and God himself would be subject to it. So we don't believe in chance. That's why, in, um, really, I, not just reform circles, but in Christian circles, we should not ever say, well, good luck. You know, we, we don't believe in such a thing as luck. God's will, God's decree, God's purposes are always what is accomplished. Okay, question 13. What hath God especially decreed concerning angels and men? Answer. God, by an eternal and immutable, that is, unchangeable decree, out of his mere love for the praise of his glorious grace to be manifested in due time, hath elected some angels to glory. Now, that's right out of Scripture. 1 Timothy 5.21. I charge you before God and Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing with partiality. There are angels that are elect. So we know that God has decreed this. God has elected uh, some angels. And 
and in Christ hath chosen some men to eternal life and the means thereof. Ephesians 1, 4, very clearly. Just as he chose us, meaning the church, the elect, the people, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, and the, the, and the answer, question 13 continues, And also, according to his sovereign power and the unsearchable counsel of his will, whereby he extendeth or withholdeth favor as he pleases, hath passed by and foreordained the rest to dishonor and wrath to be for their sin inflicted to the praise of the glory of his justice. Now, this is what people have a problem with, but it's a very clear teaching uh, of the word of God. Uh, Romans 9, 17, for the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. Another passage is 1 Peter 2, uh, 8. Uh, listen, back up one verse here. Uh, Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble, being disobedient to the word, to which they also were appointed. So their disobedience to the word, their refusal to believe the gospel, they were appointed uh, to that by God for the praise of his glorious justice. Um, more texts here, Romans 9, 21. Does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? Uh, Matthew eleven twenty five. 25. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. Why does God reveal Jesus Christ and the gospel and the truth to some and withhold it from others? Because it pleases him. Just remember, the starting point for humanity is damnation. We all start out completely lost in our sins, dead in our sins, and under God's just condemnation. So that some would receive grace is an act of love and mercy on God's part. It's not fairness. It's love and mercy. Uh, another passage, 2 Timothy 2.20 but in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, and some for honor and some for dishonor. And uh, one more text, uh, Jude, the book of Jude, verse 4. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And so God has these decrees concerning angels and men. He has decreed that some angels would be elect and others not, uh, that he would save some men and leave the rest to get what they deserve and what they desire, which is to be uh, in love with sin, to be the servants of sin, uh, and to have nothing to do with God. And there are a lot of people like that. And it's only the grace of God that causes some to turn from their sin uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ. As Jesus said, no one is able to come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. Okay, so that's question 13. We'll pick it up um, with question 14 next time. Thanks for watching.